Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Puddles and I are back in the studio here at University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon, with Gene Dowling. Gene, thanks for coming down from uh, University of Victoria. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in my namesake city. I first uh, encountered Gene when I was uh, um, just an undergraduate at Northwestern. I was reading through D. Stewart's book, and Gene has an entry in that book uh, talking about Mr. Jacobs and then several years later I was in Savannah and going through the the CD bin at the local uh, CD store in Savannah and there was Gene's uh, Bob Williams CD and then fast forward again to 2002 and we finally got to meet I finally got to meet you up at the uh, Northwest Harvey Phillips Northwest Big Brass Bash that's right in 2002 that was I think in um, Tacoma or I think so yeah like it's great to see you well it's great to be here um, Gene also studied with uh, Mr. Jacobs, and I'm just wondering if you can uh, um, just recall, recount, uh, and uh, help us to understand what it was that drew you to Jake in the first place. <sighs> that sound. You know, I, I guess I went to Interlochen as a high school student, and that's when you first started hearing about him from the other, there was, there were other tubists there, including Sam Palafian. I wonder what ever happened to him. And, you know, we were, we were mentioning, and his teacher, Constance Weldon, had studied with Mr. Jacobs as well. And, you know, he was rather legendary. And then um, I said in the, in the it, when I was a student in high school, my band director um, was playing the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra, um, the recording, the Reiner recording. And I heard that sound pouring out of the speakers, and I went, I don't know anything. <laughs> you know, I thought it was a pretty hot tuba player because I got around the horn and, and, and stuff. And, and yet that sound, it was like nothing I'd ever heard. And I started buying LPs. And, um, and then eventually, about three years after that, I got my first lesson with him. I wrote him, and that didn't get a response. And luckily, the Chicago Symphony was on tour, and I looked him up, and he doesn't write. He didn't write back. So um, I got his phone number and I called him as we all did after Star Trek on Sunday night, and I got my lesson. He loves Star Trek, and um, you know. So I started a summer of study with him. My first, uh, I was studying with Leonard Falcone at Michigan State at the time, and um, uh, with his blessing, I, you know, started working with Mr. Jacobs and in the summertime and occasionally during the year, and. Um, my first lesson was momentous, not because um, he dropped everything and thought I was the gayest thing since sliced bread. That wasn't the case at all. But because it was on the day of Neil Armstrong's walk on the moon. And so we had to watch the TV, you know, simultaneously. And uh, while the lesson progressed, as he watched me, a terribly shallow breather. Um, Player Rochu, which he hated shallow breathers to play, and, um, and go through... And I said it was like, in, in The Legacy of a Master, it was like being bombarded by all that, that language. And you walked out of there and you went, wind and song. You know, that's what you remembered. And I was really weak on the wind and, and I got better with the song part. And um, so, yeah, and eventually that, that was the place I, I wanted to go. So I graduated from Michigan State, moved there, polished mouthpiece cups at Chilkey's, and taught in inner city Chicago for a year, saving enough money to go to Northwestern for graduate school, and then freelanced and, and continued to work with him in the Civic Orchestra. I was very blessed to have four years with him, three of them on, on scholarship, so mm -hmm. that's that great. really well. well. Back to that first lesson or two, what did he do uh, to motivate you to become not a shallow breather, but to become a deep breather? Well, you know, you could see... Um, because of the visual aids, you know, and, and he could he strap you up. It felt like you were in a Frankenstein's lab at times because he had stuff to show that your chest wasn't expanding at all and that, you, you know, the, the buzz was, was weak and, and, you know, he had oscilloscopes and, and all the, the gizmos. And I've never recreated that in my own studio, but I've, I've got oscilloscopes, I've got VU meters and things that, 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 because it takes you out of yourself. It, he had that almost a, an idea of, 
of putting you in a strange place, mm -hmm. in an unfamiliar place, and you must have felt it too. And and all of a sudden, you made leaps and bounds based on those on those moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to to bring things out of you. Because he put he he introduced strangeness in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, which which allowed you to to get out of yourself. Yes. And, um, you know, my buzz was weak because it was not propelled by air. And um, he said I should practice a half an hour a day. And I interpreted that to mean I should sit down for half an hour and buzz my mouthpiece. I'd rather get, a, a, you know, a, a, a skewer driven through my eye than practice for half an hour on mouthpiece alone. But, you know, by a combination of, of melodies and drills, um, you know, and then... In the practice session, buzzing, and now I'd use a, a, a burp or something sometimes, yeah. a buzz extension, a resistance piece, and, um, you know, um, or a visualizer, you know, a cutaway mouthpiece, all those tools that we've got, and then, you know, then, then of course, I, I put more than a half an hour a day on the mouthpiece, and, and the right notes come out most of the time, and, right. you know, but at the time, it just seemed like a monumental task. To put that amount of air and energy in. I, I remember that distinctly in my own experience also. Just yeah. that I was not a buzzer when I went there at all. You know, at yeah. all. And I was a half breather. Um, yeah. And just all, all those. It was not a pleasant experience, buzzing. And, you know, the skewer th through the eye. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> but then uh, in the end, it, it was such a help. Yeah. And, and you know, the idea of. In Civic, um, you'd often have your lesson just, you know, like on Friday morning, just before the concert you got to go into, what, for like a buck? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we were endowed, you know, by, you know, it was the training school of Chicago Symphony. And so you could reinforce what you'd heard and heard him do in, in, the, in the lesson um, by hearing him play that afternoon, sometimes... We'd be working on the, oh, let's work on Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream, the overture. Oh, crap, I don't have an F tuba. And, you know, at the time, and I plastered the E a bunch. And, um, you know, and then, then I heard him nail it, and, and he didn't use an F. No, he used <laughs> he, the York. He used the York. And as much as we would use the F now, um, you know, that was his horn. And, um, You'd only use it on special occasions. Yeah, that's Gene. I'm I'm wondering uh, during your during your time uh, Northwestern at Civic if you had any if you have any any memories of your lessons, uh, any aha moments. In your well, lessons. yeah, and 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 I think that really for me, the start of regular study with him every week. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been doing it whenever I could afford it. Well, polishing my piece at 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 at, at, at Chucky's. It took a whole week's worth of, of um, with overtime, took a whole week's worth of, of um, a, a dough to, to get, grab a lesson. Okay. But then getting every lesson every week, and I was almost unrecognizable. And we had our first wind ensemble show. John Painter was conducting, of course. And um, we were doing um, some Persichetti. And he... Um, I think my playing was almost unrecognizable. People came up to me and said, you know, don't play by feel, don't play by feel. And the deep breathing and the, the buzzing, it was all starting to work. And just think, uh, we're working a little bit on embouchure concepts because we were bringing up the low range into the mid to low range. You know that a lot of tuba players, ya da 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 you know. And he had me ripping on a low G uh, three and a half ledger lines below, and then taking it up and taking it up, and then I got this cold, and I couldn't feel anything, which was good because I couldn't play my feel because it all felt like doo doo. And then um, we had the concert, and I could barely hear, I could barely see, and people rushed up to me, and evidently it was working, wow. and that it was one of those cataclysmic things that that you wish would happen all the time, but only happens a very few times in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And um, the assistant band director at the time was um, a tubist, 
and he just, I can't, and he'd auditioned me, and I don't think he could believe it was the same person. And it was largely based on the sound concepts that I was suddenly getting, that, you know, those that aha. And, you know, you listen to it, and you think, it, and you go to the symphony, and you listen to him, you listen to the other great players. He was also really brilliant at steering, because he wasn't there. He taught downtown. He didn't teach in a studio at Northwestern. Right. And so he'd say, Forrest is really doing, you know, um, this really well. Or Dave Federley is, you know, he's really sounding good and his multiple tonguing is clean. So I'd go outside these guys' practice room and listen to what they were doing well. And I could, I had really good finger technique because Falcone was like, you know, an older Italian man with a stick and an Arbenz method. And I could play all 14 characteristic etudes in the back of Arbenz before I got out of high school. But I didn't have that sound. Yeah. Right. And then when I had the sound, then the other things applied. That was my big aha moment. So it sounds like he was really getting you to let the lower notes teach the upper notes. Yeah, because as a young young player, I decided I wanted to play Devon Williams on my double B flat um, in grade 10 or 11. And I brought all my nasty habits of the high range of squeezing into the middle and lower ranges. Like, do you notice that's a particular tuba disease? Yes. Bass trombones, they don't go, um, let's see how high we can play. They go, let's see how stinking low we can play. Yeah, and But true. tuba players have this thing that particularly with some of the solo literature, some of which I play, but um, uh, you know, you've got to have that, you, you, for, for professional, you've got to have a good solid four octave range. Yeah. But we we do it all wrong and you hear it time and time again and so that's something you know we all need to work on and he he, he did work on letting the lower notes teach the upper and I, re I remember him talking about you know speaking about lower notes uh, just within context of the tuba he, i remember him talking about how the human ear is drawn to the extremes it's not drawn to the middle range so a high note on the tuba player excites only another tuba player it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily excite somebody in the audience. No, it doesn't. You know, it's not but, like Maynard going for a high note. Exactly, or a soprano. going, or, But yeah. a low note, well played on the tuba, that's exciting to the average person in the audience. Well, yeah, I remember hearing um, Roger Bobo um, playing Mahler Three live in L.A. and going, huh, because he could pop those low notes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you, we all, I was maybe 19 or 20 when Roger's first album came out. And for me, I was so excited by the high notes. I got encounters and, and then, you know, I, I said, maybe I should put this away until I learned to play in the mid to low ranges. And I finally did. But that was, you know, and, but as a mature player, I went, Okay, that's possible. Mm -hmm. Now let's 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 work on how to do that. Yeah, you know, and because not a lot of people could pop, you know, those notes like um, like Warren Deck and you know and Mr. Jacobs and and Roger, you know, they're just so that in and of itself. That's true. That's exciting. It is exciting. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, do you, uh, you study with Jacobs over a fairly large period of time. It wasn't just during those the, the four years that you had mm -hmm. uh, in and around your time of master's uh, degree study as well as civic. You went, you went further. You'd come back from Victoria for lessons and that sort of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, for years. And I was really proud of um, one time when I was trying to warm up in the hall. I'd just flown in. You know, taking public transit in a taxi, and then, you know, I was there quietly playing in the hall, and I heard that beautiful resonant voice, that sounds very good, and um, thank you, sir, and he was acknowledging that, you know, that my professional experience and my, my own hard work was was paying off, and, and um, so we talked about it, and and then um, certainly coming and seeing him in Eugene, his last West Coast master class. 1991? Yeah, yeah. and um, 
you know, too, because it was so close to, um, to when we lost him. And, um, you know, you'd see um, an older colleague, Richard Ely, at, uh, at the University of Victoria, um, taught horn, and he was quite tight in his youth and had played professionally in Dallas and then went back to Chicago, studied with Jacobs, and he talked a lot about the tape recorder in his head. And, of course, for us, it was the tuba in the hand and the tuba in the head. Mm -hmm. And so you could see the evolution of thought. And, of course, I don't know whether he mentioned it too, too, but Mr. Jacobs said, you know, sometimes I just sit down in a chair and I think about this stuff. Am I telling you guys the right thing? Mm -hmm. Because it was so revolutionary. You recall that in the early days, some of his former colleagues that he considered him a heretic. Yeah, well, D. Stewart, you were reminding me of that D. Stewart, D. Stewart story. Yeah, that, the but story. That, that, that he was, he, Jacobs had fixed his playing, and, you know, was, um, and he was gotten so much so that he, he left St. Louis and got Philadelphia, and, and a colleague in Philadelphia said, what are you doing that buzzing thing for? And then D, I believe in one of these things, said, um, later he was playing with the Summit Brass in one early morning call. Everybody was buzzing their mouthpiece, re ready for an early morning gig. And, uh, you know, so the, the pedagogy in its time was revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And as much as they might have resented it, when they ran into trouble, they all came to see him. A lot of people did. A lot of people did. Yeah. And, you know, not just tuba players, but trumpet players and oboe players. And, you know, I remember a flute player, um, you know, and um, had made the pilgrimage to the Chicago studio. And in the old days, to the somewhat messy basement that was piled with old scientific Americans and, and newspapers going back to God knows when. But, um, you know, it was... Um, it was lovely to see over the years the, the you know how, how much and I was so proud in the early 90s when my own album came out the English tuba mm -hmm. and I called him and um, I sent him one and I said do you like it he said I think it's very very good oh, and so that funny. was you know a, a great validation you know and and of course the story that I just mentioned the um, it was wonderful as a teacher to be able to call up Mr. Jacobs on Sunday evening and say, I've got this student with, or I've got a thing. And, you know, my favorite story of that was, he said, you really want to be a great teacher, don't you? And I said, yes, sir, Mr. Jacobs. And he said, it's easy, get great students. <laughs> and, um, but of course, you know, after 30 some years, your, your reputation grows. But Whenever I complained, when I was a, a callow youth of 20, taking the bus into Chicago um, and ending up at his house after, you know, uh, coming, the guy after me, he'd come in from Sweden. So forget nine hours on a bus. Right. <laughs> I, right. Was a, I was a biker. Right, right. Well, you know, you, you, over the period of time, did you notice any, any change in, you know, you mentioned that he told you that he would sometimes he would just sit down and think about these things and yeah did, and, and did you notice nomenclature and and just fine little details and you know all of that you know and um because he was so concerned with doing it right and he was doing it in a vacuum because only he had all that information right we did he didn't have a schematic diagram that worked with you Ten years after me, mm -hmm. you know, he had, you know, these revolutionary thoughts, because when a young Vincent Chickowitz, you know, came in for lessons, he'd studied with a teacher who shall remain nameless, um, who kept jumping on his stomach, a 200-pound man jumping on his abdominal region, telling him to support that way, and it wasn't working very well for Vince, mm -hmm. you know, and. Um, and that led to a whole revolution in trumpet pedagogy, right? And and a whole brass section that 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 played a certain way, mm -hmm. and 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 all taught a certain way. I wrote, you know, when I when I went first went went to him in eighty one, 
He, it was Wind on Song. Was it Wind on Song when you were with him in the 70s? Yes, and then it became, yes, and then it became Song and Wind, and you later, mentioned. Yeah, later it became Song and Wind. Well, and I think that the, the song is the motivator. Yeah. And um, I looked through old notes in preparing for this, and that wonderful um, Poder Andro, mm -hmm. you know, remember the blue book and the red yeah. book? They're mm -hmm. French horn etudes. And um, the C, if you're going to read it in C treble clef, you could read it E flat or C or F, whichever, you know, transposition you were using. And, um, but, you know, so I was in C, G, da, 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 da. And of course, I was on C tuba at the time, and I splattered the C two or three times. And he said, look, you can have it in a bell like you know, for, for half an hour beforehand, but unless it's in a bell exactly the same moment, you're fried. And in a bong, and then I stopped missing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know. So you would just, you would make sure that you thought about it just as you were about to play it. Exactly. And just simultaneous. Yeah. And and that idea of, 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 of you know, of doing it in that way it was immensely important for the rest of my career. I have good ears. I, at some point in adolescence, I figured out I had perfect pitch. I could name notes on the piano and and somehow that didn't apply to the tuba hmm. and then it did and then boom you know but I I taught ear training for 14 years mm -hmm. and you can make great strides and of course Mr. Jacobs studied solfeggio right. at Curtis for 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 seven years between the ages of 15 and 22 and he could sing any of that stuff so that was obviously the motivator for him. It doesn't matter what we're born with, but through the ear, as he said, it's just wasted space, unless you know, unless you're you're, you're using that ear in conjunction mm -hmm. to get the right notes all of the time. Gene, you'd mentioned that uh, uh, in your uh, earlier time with with Jacobs, he had you buzzing melodies and drills. Did that change? Did, did that? Uh, did he have you doing that all the time? Or yeah, and and. Sometimes when he thought my interpretive focus was lousy, mm -hmm. he'd use the the um, the mouthpiece as an artistic motivator too. Um, in the middle of something else, he'd suddenly have me playing "Pop Goes the Weasel" on the mouthpiece, mm -hmm. and the idea of imagining a child and entertaining that child and delighting that child with a, a, an animated version of Pop Goes the Weasel, perhaps using your eyebrows as he was so, he did so beautifully. And that idea of imagination um, really spurred my practice. And, and as we mentioned, you know, in private conversation, he believed that the um, oboe players needed drills more because they played melodies all the time. We didn't play melodies all the time. And so we need drills lesson and need to go to the, the melodies for motivator to accompany with excellence, as he mm -hmm. called it. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of using melodies in, in, on the mouthpiece and, and on the horn, um, you know, as an artistic motivator um, was, was wonderful for us. And um, it got me thinking about using my imagination and my own practice. I had studied the Arben's book backwards and forwards, but I hadn't studied it down an octave or up two octaves or, you know, um, uh, all slurred or, you know, to try and get the tone out rather than just become straight articulation. Mm -hmm. And his way of flexibility in using the Arben's or, or anything that he used with us, you know, when you, you got over a little hump and you got to be a big boy, you would start to use Schlossberg and, and you know, and of course, you, your your formative study was with him, and so you would have gone through that progression mm -hmm. yourself. And um, but a lot of it was just to to create the artist and the mouthpiece and and the horn were just two more ways to do that. Yeah, it, it, it was very strong, at least in my lessons, probably because I needed it more. But he, he would say that um, accompanimal accompanimental parts um, breed accompaniment. Uh, Accompanimental parts breed a limited musician. And uh, so you had to go beyond the parts that were available for the tuba player 
Uh, and so we would steal um, literature from you know the horn players and the oboe players and, and the trumpet players. We've got that, and we've got the, and that's a, you know, by using the, he hated the Irvins that trombone method, and so I went out and bought the treble clef and learned to deal with it. Right. And um, because there weren't that melodies in the back. No. Of the trombone and the harp. Yeah. Until and until recently. As well as all those stupid mistakes in that old edition. Right. And. Um, when I was a young man, Falcone spot a mistake, you know, like, oh, page 238, oh, there's a spot. And I thought, how does he do that? And, you know, let's see, that's 44 years of, of teaching out of that book. I can I can say, oh, there's a mistake, and, mm -hmm. and you know, in bar 37. But, um, but in, in, you know, the, he could, um, he encouraged us just to use everything. And now, of course, through the recordings that we've got, through the, the the legacy of a master mm -hmm. series, right. um, we heard that wonderful thing at the very first tuba symposium in 1973, and Mr. Jacobs sat on stage with the York and played the opening solo of Scheherazade. Right. And now that's a long time ago. I was 23. It's over 40 years ago. But. And there are all these guys in the exhibit, and unfortunately, in Indiana, um, there was they were all in the open, and there were people trying to play louder than other people. And it wasn't like, although Warren may have been a young man and was there, he was in Michigan at the time. Um, it wasn't Warren Deck loud; it was just ugly loud. And this was, and all these people were trying to impress each other, but this gorgeous melody floating out. There was an audible. Oh. All these people who had been blasting went, oh, so that's how it's done. Mm -hmm. And I think that he didn't dazzle them with his volume, which was greater than anyone else sitting in that room, all 600 of us, mm -hmm. but he dazzled them with his sheer musicianship and beauty of sound in the soft over. The three octaves that he played. Yeah, that's pretty, just amazing. And I, I there's a recording of that, you know, on the on the uh, Frank Burns um, C, CDs, the Legacy series. Yes, and then some gorgeous. of his own practice, yeah. where he's playing Bahim um, Bum Bum Machardus or something. Machardus, yeah. And and, he, and then, he, oh my, that was fast. <laughs> and and that's that's like him. But he would he wouldn't set up a recital, but he would set up a recital. To challenge himself, because let's face it, a tuba player needs challenges, otherwise. Exactly. Gene, there must have been time during your time in Civic when you were called upon to play either as an extra or a substitute in the Chicago Symphony. I, I did second tuba, and I did um, I I got to play Mahler two for Abado. We'd done Mahler six for him um, in in Civic. What was it like sitting next to Jake? And, uh... <laughs> well, I, th this one story, we were doing Rite of Spring, and I can confess in front of everybody who watches this video that um, my low A, the three ledger lines below the bass staff, was one of my weakest notes, A and A flat. So, bop, 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 um, the um, night on Ball Mountain terrified me. And so there I was playing A, C, bump, bump. And Mr. Jacobs, who was at Ravinia, said, oh, you just have to goose it a little. And of course, his bell was, unfortunately, next to my right ear. And he just went, wham! And he, he hit this low A. And there are 107 or how many ever of us there were, people on stage who just stopped before this recently went, what the? And, you know, they turned around and Mr. Jacobs, oh, I, I guess I got carried away. But... He he made everybody just stop with this one note, and and several minutes later, their hearing resumed in my right ear. But it was the idea of that power, and the idea that he taught you to use all that air at once. Remember how hard that was at first? Yes. And so you basically, whew, it's easier with a 64-year-old relaxed stomach than it was with a 23-year-old unrelaxed stomach. Mm -hmm. But um, the... Um, the idea being that that it just all that air was the motivator and went at once, and um, so it wasn't strength. No, and 
you know, and, and when I try to explain to my students initially, um, strength is an enemy, weakness a friend, they look at me like I'm from Mars. Then it makes sense in the, when they feel it in their own bodies and they hear it in their own sound. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. And what about, you know, how would you compare Falcone? I mean, you studied with two of the most well-known teachers of the 20th century. Yeah, lucky me. I grew up next to Falcone, and I was this kid with a sousaphone at summer music camp, and Marty Erickson was there, and, and a few years older, and um, um, and I had the guts to, to go up without my parents' permission and say, can I audition for you, and, and got to study with Falcone privately. Um, Falcone was a great motivator um, for and a wonderful musician. He uh, there is a connection between the two teachers, in that um, Rosetta, Italy, uh, where Leonard Falcone grew up, and Philip Donatelli, Jake's teacher, at Curtis. Jake's teacher at Curtis, was you know grew up in the same little town, and were taught by Donato Donatelli, the town bandmaster. Falcone, I told you last night that. Falcone could single tongue 176 to the metronome. It was just the most extraordinary thing, and his tongue would make this point. But I forgot to tell you that he talked about they had tonguing contests. When they were kids, he played alto horn, and um, they, when you got to be good enough and somebody retired or died, you got to play in the town band. And so they'd had tonguing contests, and he said, there was this one alto horn player. Now, he could really tongue. And I thought, how fast was that? And something about the Italian language, you know, their, their tongue's point, and they do all tongue between their teeth. Mm -hmm. People who've taught, Velvet Brown has taught a great deal in Italy and, and, and um, speaks some Italian. So it's, you know, it's marvelous. But Falcone was, the music was the, 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 simil the great similarity was that music was the was a be-all and end-all, but he was more the soloist. And he taught me to, to kind, of, kind of come out of myself as a soloist and, mm -hmm. and instilled my great love of solo playing, you know. And um, in that wonderful book um, about chamber music by a member of the Bozart Trio, he talked about, um, I think it was Bette Pressler, talked about the soloist is the most free, the orchestral player is the least free in terms of time, mm -hmm. and then the chamber person is that person in the middle. Mm -hmm. And that really shows it up in, in all our playing that mm -hmm. we do in chamber music, And but we're guided, we're, the difference with Jacobs was guided by that, that incredible Chicago Symphony rhythm, the, the, the Reiner trained Chicago Symphony. And when you're on that machine, the process of elimination is great. There's something wrong. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're playing with those guys, and, and I got to play for Rostyshvinsky. Um, I came in to play second tuba on Alpine Symphony, yeah. and I was stupid enough not to look at the first tuba part. Oh. And Mr. Jacobs got okay. sick. And so, in the middle of the rehearsal, I'm trying to read the score to Alpine Symphony, which is kind of hard because, yeah. And so, um, Russell Ward came in to play uh -huh. second, and Russ was in Civic with me. And then, um, and we did, um, yeah, so, and then one time Mr. Jacobs was, um, oh, his father died, and I got a call, and my father died. You're going in tonight. And of course they were playing well-known repertoire. Howard Hansen's Second Symphony and um, Benjamin Lee's Piano Concerto. Uh, not so much in the second. <laughs> yeah. And so we'd met, you know. And so there I sat and everybody walked by and said, Jake's father? Yeah. Because he'd, he'd taken a couple of weeks off and I'd been in. And um, he was back on the way to Philadelphia. And um, and everybody was very helpful. You know, there's a tuba solo in the third movement of the Hanson. Yes, 
I know that, thank you. You know that there's a third, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And uh, Mike Hanek, the, the, the wonderful oboist, who's still in the Chicago Symphony, stepped by and said, you really sound like you knew what you were doing there, which was a lovely compliment. <laughs> Oh, that's a great one. And, uh, but yeah, so, but sitting in that, that, that incredible rhythm, you know, um, Don Harry described William Bell's rhythm as like Count Basie rhythm. And they all had that mm -hmm. from the Reiner time. And of course, I don't think anybody was more lucky or unlucky to work with Fritz Reiner longer in their, their current than Arnold Jacobs. Right. From right. the time he was 15. Yeah. I don't know whether that lasted all through Curtis, probably, and then um, then Pittsburgh and then Chicago. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he was well trained and 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 fearless because of that. Put his thoughts in the right place. Yes, that's for sure. Well, this is Oktoberfest time here at University of Oregon, and Gene is here um, as our guest artist. We're so happy to have you here, and uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Puddles, as usual, has uh, instructed me to uh, present you with a token of our Thanksgiving. This is a genuine uh, Tuba People TV mug, suitable for many types of beverages, hot and cold. So well, we I look forward to consuming my beverages from my namesake, Eugene. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. It's good to see you. It's good my pleasure. You. Yeah. And now back to you.